Two souls, alas, do dwell within his breast. The one is ever parting from the other. Obviously, capitalists don't necessarily invest all the surplus value or their profit back into their business. They consume some of it for themselves as well. However, this appears to cause a contradiction for individual capitalists. To invest more back into production means they have less to consume for themselves. And likewise, to spend more on themselves means they would have less to invest back into production. In this section and some of the next, Marx examines this contradiction in both its technical aspects and some of these social attitudes that have historically developed around it. So far, therefore, as his actions are a mere function of capital, his own private consumption is a robbery perpetrated on accumulation. Just as in bookkeeping by double entry, the private expenditure of the capitalist is placed on the debtor side of his account against his capital. To accumulate is to conquer the world of social wealth, to increase the mass of human beings exploited by him, and thus to extend both the direct and the indirect sway of the capitalist. Marx begins by yet again critiquing William Nassau Sr., whose abstinence theory argued that capitalists can only expand production if they sacrifice their personal life by abstaining from purchasing luxury goods or refusing to consume their profits and instead investing them back into production. Marx's argument, which we'll look at even further in the next section, is that when early capitalists were fighting for social domination against the aristocracy and attempting to get capitalism functioning, this idea was true. They had to focus on investing in their business and prioritize accumulation. However, under a fully developed capitalist system, it is not. Marx here examines the general attitudes of the early capitalist class during the formation of very early capitalism and their condemnation of other capitalists or monarchies for their greed, hoarding and desire for luxury instead of investment. This is particularly interesting as this attitude of good and bad capitalist is still very prevalent today on all sides of the political spectrum, even in left-wing discourse. And this missing the forest for the trees often helps to legitimize capitalism. Lots of media, whether film or books, news and even capitalist economists themselves focus on these bad capitalists because for the most part, they are bad at being capitalists and bad for the continual expansion or smooth running of capitalism as a totality. In volumes two and three, we'll see how many internal contradictions within capitalism itself leads to many various socioeconomic crises. And of course, the coercive laws of competition that drive individual capitalists certainly leads to the creation of these bad apples. However, this focus on the bad helps to legitimize the good, tax-paying, charity-giving, job-creating capitalist and their continual accumulation, which hides the fact that all capitalists are entirely dependent on the exploitation, alienation and domination of their labor force and that they are systematically linked to exploitation all over the world. When a certain stage of development has been reached, a conventional degree of prodigality, which is also an exhibition of wealth and consequently a source of credit, becomes a business necessity. Another interesting but brief point that Marx notes is that the purchasing of luxury goods and exhibition of wealth instead of reinvesting also becomes a necessity for capitalists to a certain extent. As early capitalism developed, eventually the point was reached where increased productivity in the production of luxury goods made them cheaper. During this early period of capitalism, capitalists had to fight, both politically and socially, against the monarchies and landed aristocracy until they became the ruling elite. To do this, they often replicated the exhibition of wealth and luxury of the old aristocracy, 
to give themselves social power, representation, and a veil of respect and trust, essentially building their brand, which further helps for future accumulation. This, obviously, we still see today in many ways, whether as an individual social status or in advertising and building a reputation. However, Marx reminds us that the coercive laws of competition are still the driving force behind the capitalist class, and any individual who focuses too much attention on this consuming of surplus value for themselves will soon find themselves unable to compete against those who focus on investment and accumulation. Marx also reminds us that either way, it is not the capitalist class that are abstaining from consuming the surplus value that is created, but the exploited working class. Moreover, the capitalist gets rich, not like the miser in proportion to his personal labour and restricted consumption, but at the same rate as he squeezes out the labour power of others and enforces on the labourer abstinence from all of life's enjoyments. Regardless of the split between personal consumption and investing back into the business, the total amount of accumulated surplus value from the previous cycle is what's important for future accumulation. Marx now returns to an analysis of what affects this total amount. Wages, says John Stuart Mill, have no productive power. They are the price of a productive power. Wages do not contribute, along with the labour, to the production of commodities, no more than the price of tools contributes along with the tools themselves. If labour could be had without purchase, wages might be dispensed with. But if the labourers could live on air, they could not be bought at any price. While Marx, throughout Capital, has assumed that wages are equal to the value of labour power, we are reminded here that they are not while Marx also takes a historical look at capitalist constant attempts and successes at lowering the value of the wage. There's details of capitalist political attempts at lowering the value of English wages to that of other levels in other countries, the adulteration of medicine, or even attempts at researching and producing certain types of very cheap food that would mean it costs less for labour to reproduce itself. All these examples show just how carefully capitalists throughout history have calculated the minimum wage that could support workers at the absolute lowest possible, and a general historical trend at trying to force the value of the wage down. It's also important to remember, however, that whatever workers need for their self-reproduction is socially and historically defined. As we see in today's world, the minimum living wage for someone working in London is more than someone working in Nottingham. Another important point throughout these examples is that wherever and whenever, capitalists have continued to attempt to pay less than this minimum by getting other people to provide the means of subsistence to the workers. Thus, we see an historical rise of church charities and workhouses who would provide food, clothing or houses to workers, allowing the capitalists to lower the value of wages to a new level of subsistence. Today, we still have the same from various state welfare programmes that provide some of these things, allowing the value of the wage to be lower, to the rapid increase in austerity politics during the current neoliberal era forcing the real wage to be as low as possible, as a subsequent increasing use of food banks and charities provide the rest of the subsistence for the labourer's self-reproduction. Although in all branches of industry, that part of the constant capital, consisting of instruments of labour, must be sufficient for a certain number of labourers, it by no means always necessarily increases in the same proportion as the quantity of labour employed. Another point that Marx makes is that it's not always the case that constant capital must increase proportionately to variable capital. For example, let's imagine 100 workers are employed at a factory 
for eight hours a day. That's a total of 800 hours of labor power. If the capitalist wishes to increase this amount to 1,200 total hours a day, they could employ 50 more workers. However, this would mean they also have to increase the means of production proportionately. 50 more workers means they would also need to purchase new machines for those workers to work upon. However, the capitalist could achieve the same amount of hours by simply increasing the amount of time their original 100 labourers worked, from 8 to 12 hours a day, meaning no new machinery would need to be purchased. So we can see the amount that has to be invested back into the business doesn't always have to be a constant, even with accumulation. As productivity and labour increases, the total amount of surplus products also increases, meaning the capitalist now has even more surplus value or profits to use, allowing them more freedom in their choice between consuming it for themselves or reinvesting back into their business. As we saw throughout part four of Capital, productivity also cheapens the individual products produced. As productivity within the production of luxury goods also cheapens them, it allows capitalists to spend less of their profits while purchasing them and thus more on investing. Not only that, but as productivity increases the industries that produce the instruments of labour themselves, the machines, tools, raw materials, etc., it also cheapens them, allowing capitalists to spend less on investing in these things over time, while still increasing the amount of these things that they actually purchase. For example, maybe now our capitalists can buy five hat making machines for the same price as they would have previously bought three for a few years earlier. Likewise, the same can be said for the lowering of the value of labour power that comes from increased productivity. Cheaper supply of workers means the capitalists can now get more for the same amount or even less spent. As we saw in chapter eight, increases to the speed of production over a given amount of time or productivity within labor allows for the greater transfer of older values embodied within the materials of production into the mass of final products. For example, increased productivity in hat making increases the amount of value of cotton that is actually transferred to the total amount of final product or the total collection of hats made, essentially meaning the capitalist has a higher value of total products to sell, thus an increase in surplus value, or every cycle as capital accumulates, the capitalist can actually afford to purchase more and more constant capital on an increasing scale and put it to use, which generates more and more production on an increasing scale. As we discussed in chapter 11, the total mass of surplus value is dependent on the amount of laborers employed and the degree of exploitation. More surplus value to invest means the capitalist can purchase more labor power to exploit. And with the falling value of labor power from productivity, this means a capitalist can continually generate more and more surplus value over time even with just the same amount of surplus value spent on labor power each time, even if they are actually purchasing more workers. What we've seen through all these aspects of accumulation is that the share between investing or purchasing luxury goods for the capitalist that we discussed in section three actually becomes somewhat irrelevant. While in percentage terms, capitalists may indeed use a lesser percent of surplus value to purchase luxury goods, but the constant increases to their profits, the cheapening of luxury items, and the cheapening of labor power and means of production to invest back into, means they can essentially spend a lot less on luxury items while still obtaining more of them. To reiterate, 
it is not the capitalist class that are abstaining from consuming the surplus value that's created, but the exploited working class. The more that capital increases by successive accumulation, the more does the sum of value increase that is divided into a fund for consumption and a fund for accumulation. The capitalist can therefore have a more pleasant life and at the same time renounce more. And finally, the more the scale of production extends, along with the mass of capital advanced, the greater the expansive capacity of its driving forces. In this short section, Marx attacks an old notion from classical political economy that argued that the total capital of society has a fixed magnitude and that the amount of capital in society that could be used to purchase labour power or the so-called labour fund was limited to a certain amount. This, at the time, was used to justify the capitalist class telling workers that there was only so much money in society that they could spend on wages, that there was no point in fighting for higher wages, and that if certain workers fought and won higher wages, it would come at the cost of lower wages for others. What Marx has shown us throughout Capital, however, is that capital is not a fixed magnitude, but a part of social wealth which is elastic and constantly fluctuates with the division of surplus value into revenue additional capital. Eventually, at the turn of the 20th century, this idea of a fixed labour fund was dropped from political economy. Classical economy always loved to conceive social capital as a fixed magnitude of a fixed degree of efficiency. But this prejudice was first established as a dogma by the arch philistine Jeremy Bentham, that insipid, pedantic, leather-tongued oracle of ordinary bourgeois intelligence of the 19th century.